Um, so this talk is about food hypes. And this is the title I got, actually, You Are What You Eat. And in this talk, I will try to explain what, how we look at food hypes and why there are food hypes and why are people eating what they eat. And Gary already mentioned that uh, identity is a very important part of food hypes. Um, well, I'm very happy that you still came here, despite of the weather, um, to, uh, to listen to my favorite topic. And I guess it's the favorite topic of many of you. I think there are 16 million food specialists, food experts here. And uh, during the lecture, I'll, from time to time, I, I would like to ask you some questions. Um, because we all have something with food and nutrition. Yeah? And it's determining our lives. And at a certain moment, it may also start to determine other people's lives. Um, so what I will do, I will discuss mainly the role of science in this, because this is a scientific event. Um, what I will try to emphasize is how important education and communication is. Actually, I will also show that it may be at this stage, it's more important than knowledge, than physiology. I have a background in physiology and pharmacology, and it's also directly my disclaimer here. Um, I, I realize that I enter in, in other fields of expertise. So I think this story is mainly about social sciences, maybe, or behavioral sciences, about communication, about convincing people. Because otherwise other people try to convince you. It's also about gurus, it's about hypes, and it's about distrust in science. Well, to start with the title of this, uh, of this lecture, and I got the title, and actually this is derived from the quote of, um, of a guy called Feuerbach, and uh, he lived, uh, well, I, I have to, to show it, it was around 1800 something, um, 1862. He said, the mensch ist was er ist, you are what you eat. But actually, this quote is not really uh, in line with, with the talk of today. Because actually, he was, mean, he was referring to materialism. He said, okay, he was opposing against Christianity, against religion in those days. He said, okay, you're just molecules, you're just food. So actually, there was something different. Maybe this quote of uh, Jean-Antoine Briac Safarin, he lived uh, around the French Revolution, and he made this uh, quote, I think, 1820 or something. He said, tell me what you eat, and I'll tell you who you are. And I think this is more applicable to well, the topic of today. And uh, actually, he was a politician and a lawyer, and uh, he wrote one of the first books about the physiology of taste. So, about it. So, when we talk about about hypes, why is why is food so so important, and why are we so much emotionally linked to food? Well, first of all, of course, it's a it's a basic instinct. We we need to eat. I would say, well, there's, there's two basic instincts, it's sex and food, and sex is simple and food is complex, yeah? maybe even com more complicated. And one of the things, of course, is identity. You don't want to be this person, and you might want to be this person. Huh? So it's identity, identification, um, and this is also one of the difficulties, and I will come back to that issue, uh, when a scientist you are discussing with food gurus, because our message is often quite negative. Uh, we have to say to the pu public, well, you, you should not become like this guy. You should behave yourself. You should eat less. You should eat healthy. And when you can't promise that people will become like this. If I would be on television and say, okay, uh, this is my killer body and uh, eat like me and listen to me and you become like this, well, nobody would believe me as a scientist. So our message is kind of negative, and I'll come back to that. Well, you are aware of the fact that there are incredibly many food hypes. And a question to you as audience, uh, who is, and uh, well, I'm, I'm not pointing towards any specific, there's no judgment here, who is following a specific diet or a specific lifestyle, has specific eating habits, like vegan, paleo? Yeah, may I ask what you, what you kind of... Um, I have gout, so I okay. Yeah, that's for medical reasons, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. I wouldn't call it a hype, that's a clear, yeah, well, yeah. Anybody else? Huh? Vegetarian. vegetarian, okay. Well, that's a kind of, let's say, generally accepted, not a typical hype. But 
But for example, take Palio, which is one of the fashion at the moment. Low carb is very much well. Atkins is already getting out of fashion. Superfoods, supplement, there's a lot. And detox, for example, is, is keeping up very popular. Well, there are many hypes. And um, I'm not going to, to, too much in detail about specific hypes, but okay, the idea that there are so many hypes already shows that there are so many disagreements when it comes to what is healthy or what is good for you or actually what is uh, well, it's fitting to your identity. So the question is, okay, why do people worry about their food? Well, I think there are several reasons. One of this is that there is the, the health and the evolutionary paradox. And I will show you what it is. You may say, okay, what is that, the evolutionary paradox? But I'll come back to that. There are many social and psychological factors. You are what you eat. Actually, you want to be what you eat. You want to identify yourself with a certain group of people and in general, well, the highly educated people in general, it's a generalization, I realize, well, might want to identify themselves with a healthy, young, living style, um, maybe, well, let's say, uh, conscious to sustainability, that's also a high a trend nowadays, and that's what a group you want to belong to. And there's a lot of political and economical factors, and I will show you that commercial interests are getting more and more important at this stage. Yesterday it was announced that even a big company like Unilever is, is now bringing fresh foods to the market, fresh vegetables. And that's completely new because they were number one in packed food. So that's really changing uh, society at the moment. Well, to start with the, let's say, the simple thing, with, the, with the, our physiology, our behavior, our instincts. And uh, you may have seen it before, you may have learned it's always been the survival of the fittest. Well, in terms of why are we eating, why are people overeating at the moment, it could be the survival of the fattest. So 100,000 years ago, if, if there was, well, there, sometimes there was food, but very often there was no food. And every meal could be your last meal. So genetically, we are selected to be able to store, to locate food, to store calories, to eat a lot of things, and also to well, to, to store fat. So we are made to become this, but of course in the past you didn't become like this because there, was no, there were not so many calories available. But nowadays, this is a part of the map of uh, Hoogkaterijne. If you, if you walk from the railway station to, uh, to the Vredeburg, well, this is only a few, but you look at all these food stores. So you're constantly influenced by, by food. And uh, it's the battle against calories for many of them and well of course there are people that are not tempted to take these, these, these products but at the same time many of us are. So that's the survival of the fattest actually our genes are now acting against us. Well this I just showed you to, to say okay you would say okay, this is complicated this is a regulation of eating behavior at the level of the brain and the gut so this is typically for, for physiologists but actually I'd wish that it could be that simple. Because eating behavior is not that simple. This is physiology. We can, we can measure things. We can, we can measure how much people take. We can measure hormones. We can take blood samples. We can measure, we, we take MRIs and we all study these kind of things, but it's a societal issue. So this is just physiology. And because it's so difficult and it's so complicated, people are, let's say, filling the gaps and filling the needs. And this you may recognize, who recognized this lady? Rens Kroes, the sister of Doudson. And Rens is, for example, advertising this kind of thing. Clay detox, oil pulling. So putting oil in the mouth and it's extracting the bad things from the mouth. And, uh, well, it makes her more happy. Well, she's also propagating superfoods and she uses happy cleansing. Well, she has, uh, she made an awful lot of money off this, this. And, well, she, she found really a demand, a consumer's demand, you could say. But it's getting even worse. Uh, let's say the anti-message, so trying to scare people or trying to, let's say, to look for, um, uh, well, suspicious things and, and uh, um, what do you call complot theory, can I come? Conspiracy theory uh, is, is at, at the moment a very strong movement. So anti-bread, low-carb, uh, 
bribing by industry and not believing that, uh, that scientists say the right things. And that's uh, actually a very important trend as well at the moment. Uh, but in a general way, that in a general sense, people already knew that, that eating too much or eating too healthy, unhealthy, is, is while well, not a positive thing. And that's, this is part of the seven mortal sins of Hieronymus Bosch, 1500 something. And this is the gula, so the gluttony, the overeating. So people already knew for a long time that it's actually there's a, is a balance. You have to find the right balance between overeating and behaving like you should do. So people are struggling with food. And it's, some people make use of this. It's the commercial aspect, it's the economical factors that are actually using this. And as scientists, we have to deal with these kind of factors. So some people say, okay, just leave it. Huh? They say, okay, well, let's, let's take the temptation as it is, and let's say, okay, uh, rot op met je chia zaad, as Linda says, well, uh, fuck off with your chia, chia zaad, seeds are one of the superfoods. They say, okay, don't pay any attention. But I think this is also not a very good way to deal with it. And even this is a very nice example, I don't know if you've seen it, this is the so-called hard attract grill. It's in Arizona. You can buy a quadruple bypass burger, and everything is, uh, is served with, uh, with a a French fries in pure lard, so in, in well, uh, saturated fat. And you can, buy, you can get uh, cigarettes and soda, and they make a f uh, a f fun out of this, of course, and uh, a special parking lot for the ambulance. And the, uh, the waitresses are dressed up like nurses. So people say, okay, well, we, we, we can't deal with this anymore, and just, just okay, let it go and uh, make a fool out of this. Who knows what this is? I forgot to look up the English word, actually. And Dutch is an aflaat, but I actually, I forgot the English word. Aflaat, so it's a kind of ticket to heaven. So you could buy this in, uh, uh, it's giving a kind of absolution, so there's also a product giving absolution. So what I personally see, there's a lot of, let's say, parallels between nowadays nutritional um, movements, so hypes, and the old-fashioned, well, the old-fashioned, well, the, the classical idea of religions, where you also had different ways of looking at what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And this is a typical thing that people tend to say, okay, if I eat healthy, I become more healthy, I live longer. And it's a kind of similar thing as, as in the past. People say, okay, if you behave well, this was your ticket to health, to, to heaven. Actually, you also had to pay in those days. And uh, you see this kind of uh, products on the market, life extension complex, absolutions. So they really say, okay, you're absoluted for your sins. So it's a typical thing. But I think this is, this is I think, the main point I want to make. As scientists, we are faced with this movement. So what could we do about it? And one uh, very important thing is that, that the audience doesn't believe us anymore. And why are, why does the public not believing scientists like nutrition science? Why are they say, okay, uh, well, this is the vaccine. That's a similar kind of discussion. Uh, we have a lot of evidence. We, we show that we have evidence and still people say, well, but we don't trust you. We don't trust companies. We don't trust the nutrition center. Um, we don't trust scientists. We have our own ideas. We have our own way of of living and our own way of, of eating. And one of the reasons is that for, let's say, most people, risks are very difficult to interpret. I just gave an example. Well, dailies are disease-adjusted life years, so it's a kind of health, well, it's a kind of uh, indication for healthy, li well, he healthy life years. And if you look at, let's say, chemical risks of food, well, you all well, remember the fipronil case a few months ago. But if you in general look at what's the chemical risks of food, then it's a, a relatively minor risk. If you look at microbial infections, so bacterial present in the food, it's also a relatively small risk. But if you look at unbalanced diets, so unhealthy eating, it's a big risk. But just walking on the street, going on skiing, these are very big risks. But people are very, it's very difficult for people to weigh these risks. So people listen, they hear about, okay, as a scientist coming with a boring story, so well, the, the chance that uh, fipronil in your eggs 
give, well, makes you sick is a very, very small. But still, people don't, let's say, they, they don't trust the scientists. And I think that's a, that's a major issue, and it's also a major challenge for the future. How can we make science more trustworthy? This is another example. This is the chemical composition of organic tomatoes. So if you, if you go to a, to, a, to a store and you think you buy something healthy, that's actually the, the image. So I buy organic tomatoes. There's no, they're completely free of pesticides and, and fertilizers, etc. If you would give this listing to the, to, the, to, the, to the audience, then people say, oh, oh wow. This is a real chemical stuff. I'm not, I'm not believing that this can be healthy. But it's exactly the same as an organic tomato. So it's the composition. Another one are the so-called E numbers. And I know this is, okay, this slide is not completely correct because E numbers, the famous E numbers, are added to food. And the list I give here are the E numbers which are present in the tomato. But from a chemical perspective, and I'm trained as a chemical, I don't see a difference between synthetic vitamin C, ascorbic acid, and a natural one. In some cases, there might be small differences, but in general, the same. We take, for example, uh, glutamate, phacin, a lot of discussions, monosodium glutamate. It's also present naturally. So, uh, again, so a salt replacer sounds very well, sounds very nasty. But it's, it's potassium chlorine for the chemist amongst you, or the biologist. So the thing is, why do people don't believe this? Why say people, okay, we, we don't want to have food with E numbers. We want to have natural. So what's the difference then? Well, this is the example of kale. And this is one of the possible explanations. An explanation coming from communication. Kale, well, boerenkool in, in, in the Netherlands. Kale is a so-called superfood in the United States. They, well, they, you can buy uh, kale juices. And actually, if you look at the claims, thanks to its broad nutritional profile, kale is thought to help fight cardiovascular disease, asthma, and rheumatoid arthritis, to prevent certain several types of cancer and premature aging. Wow, this is a nice promise. Huh? And if you eat your boer kool this evening, you can think, okay, this is, I'm doing very, something very good. Why is kale not a superfood in the Netherlands? Well, there's one simple explanation. It's too cheap. It's too common. It has no aura. It has no, nothing extra. So, it's, again, it's all about commercialization and, and, and communication. Kale is healthy. Don't get me wrong. It's not unhealthy, but I can't really promise. I can't, as a scientist, I can't say, well, if you eat kale every day, you don't get a heart attack. Yeah, of course, you can't tell. That's the difficulty with nutrition. Uh, these effects are very slowly occurring. You always have to, sh to, to take them in the wider context of a complete lifestyle. You can't say, okay, uh, if you eat every day this and this, it will help you. It's not like medicine. It's not like taking a pill. So it's a very complicated issue. But this is, okay, this is superfood. This is also an interesting. So how are hypes occurring? How did they develop? And this was an interesting thing. I was actually, I witnessed it more or less. In the morning, I read an article, a very boring, serious article in a journal called Food Chemistry, and it was about alginates. Alginates are molecules in algae, and it was written in the article, alginates at higher levels uh, potentially reduce the uptake of dietary 3 glycerol, so lipids, fat in your body, aiding in weight management. But this was a study done in a test tube, so a so-called in vitro study. But for one reason or another, the BBC took this. They found it. And look what, what started, what, what happened. Uh, seaweed, because alginates are in seaweed, could be the secret, oh well, look at the word secret, ingredient to losing weight, research has suggested. Okay, this was two hours later. Then a few hours later, look at this, and this one I like very much, seaweed on your sausage could help <laughs> keep weight down. So within eight hours, a very boring in vitro study uh, resulted in this kind of claims. Well, fortunately, in some, and it's very interesting when you look at food types, this disappeared within a few days, and you never heard about it. 
It's interesting, sometimes a, a hype comes up in the Netherlands, and it's not a hype in Belgium or in Germany. Sometimes they're the other way around. So it's very difficult, it's a very interesting, I think, aspect from a communications aspect. Why does something and when does something become a, well, I'm not a marketing guy, but I think it's a very interesting thing. But again, it's a kind of misuse of a scientific finding, but why does it happen and what should we do? What could we do about this? Scientific communication is very important. This is a very nice example as well. This was a serious publication. Well, serious. The New England Journal of Medicine, a very, let's say, respected medical journal, around Christmas, like the English also do, they come with interesting publications. And here you see the association between chocolate consumption per country and the number of Nobel Prize winners per 10 million people. And of course, Switzerland, they eat a lot of chocolate, is here. But you can see there's a linear relationship almost. And these people came with a correlation coefficient for the, the people know who are uh, known about, they know about this. And if you, and actually, actually, there were even a few readers of, the, of this very serious uh, journal who actually started to have a scientific discussion about it. And particularly, why is Sweden there? Well, 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 there was a well, they gave also a fake explanation why probably Sweden didn't eat that much chocolate as the Swiss did, but still they had a number of Nobel Prize winners. So there are these nice sites, if you want to ever look for, for a nice example, there are very many sites that try to give you correlations. Or you say, okay, this is ridiculous science. Nobody's going to believe this. Well, this happens a lot. Huh? And there are journals in the Netherlands that very often take this kind of net message. And you could say, okay, chocolate consumption makes you smarter, helps you to gain a Nobel Prize. Uh, the thing is, if we try to summarize all our findings, and you say, okay, if, if we talk about nutrition, what is healthy? And Gary started, okay, this guy knows what is healthy. Actually, I don't know what is healthy. I know that life patterns are healthy and food patterns are healthy, but it's very difficult to say an apple is healthy or pear is healthy. It depends very much what, the, what the, you do for the rest. So if you summarize, and this is what these people did, they tried to summarize all this kind of diets. And low carb, low carb, vegetarian, low glycemic, Mediterranean, mixed blend, they're all, let's say, considered healthy diets. And they looked at, in this case, what kind of things do they have in common? And actually, this was what they had in common. Don't eat too much, eat a varied, varied, varied diet, and increase the contribution of plants. So it's, it's good to be a vegetarian, it's good to eat a lot of vegetables and fruits, and don't eat too much. That's the simple message. But if I would tell that simple message every day on television, nobody would really believe me. Because I had to discuss that with people, with the, uh, the killer body people and all these kind of things. So that's, that again is the issue. We are, as a scientist, we show, okay, it's very complicated. It's getting, it's, it's slowly developing. Effects of food are only, let's say, are subtle all, every day. So, and summarizing this as eat, well, eat a diverse diet and mostly plant, then again, we are in trouble. So, how could you, or could people recognize a food hype? And I looked at it a little bit in the literature, I looked at other, what other people said about this, and there are some common elements in a food hype. One thing is that actually people are using scientific debate to make their point, to get their own right. People know there is disagreement in science, and I think that is, that is the, the basic thing about scientists. Well, maybe not of all scientific disciplines, but in a lot of science there is debate. And science is also developing, it's dynamic. What they also do, they use success stories and they do, okay, it helped, it helped with me. And I lost a lot of weight, so it's going to help you as well. Um, they refer to failures, so to other hypes, and they always say, well, this is really something different. Um, well, again, also the, the use of mistrust in science, already mentioned that. The use of, let's say, to oppose against conspiracy theories, warning, don't trust science, don't trust industry, don't trust government authorities. And, well, this is also a well, kind of common element, the medical, complementary, alternative, but particularly medical, is nowadays working very well. So medical, medical food and this kind of thing, they are not protected, most of them, by law, so you can use them. And the use, of course, of one-liners and simple messages. So, okay, 
Uh, do I have the answer? Well, I partly have the answer. Um, I think one of the things we have to, 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 to teach the, uh, the general public that we need to live with uncertainties. We, can't, we can't, cannot promise scientific certainty in everything. We have to teach people, um, we have to teach children uh, about risks, about science. What is, what is the result of a scientific finding? We also have to show that science is changing. People are blaming us as food scientists that, okay, you're now, you're now blaming carbohydrates. We should all eat now less sugar, whereas in the past it was less fat. How can it be? Well, my answer would be, well, the, the doctor is also operating differently than he or she did 20 years ago. But people have difficulties in accepting that a viewpoint can change in science. So I don't have the answer, and I think it's food for thought for you as well. So how should we deal with this? But it, it's, well, it's, it's a given fact that, that we find new things and we change our, our opinion about things. And sometimes we also have to admit that we don't know. And maybe it's, well, sometimes people s blame me and say, okay, that's easy. As a scientist, you say, you're a scientist, you say you don't know. But I think you better s say as a scientist that you don't know than that as a scientist you say, well, I know the answer. I sometimes tell journalists, well, okay, I, it's very clever of you that you seem to have the right answer, but I don't. So to, 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 to end with a, another quote of another very famous person, Charles Darwin, uh, when it comes to, to our attitude to food, it is very important that we have to adapt to our changing environment. And going back to the survival of the fattest, uh, that is one of the reasons that we are so much struggling with food. We haven't been able to adapt adequately to our environment. So that's one of the main things that uh, we should do in the future. And that as a consequence, it might be that we also will see uh, fewer hypes. But actually, I'm not completely sure. But as I've also said, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, economical and uh, societal impact to be made by hypes. And this was my last slide. Thank you very much.